please visit sleephappia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Register at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Welcome to the sixth annual kickoff of our Sleep Timber 2020 speaker series. This year, we are honored to have with us a new board member. This is Ernestine Key, a wife and mother and survivor uh, of a husband who she lost to apnea and stroke and heart disease. Uh, we have Jill Friedman, our chief health strategy officer, who uh, was the founder of ACOR and co-founder of Smart Patients and who has struggled with hypertension uh, for the past 20 years. We have Mark Ostrick, who is our sleepapnea.org uh, producer and who is a three-time open heart surgery survivor since 1977. And last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Robert Thomas, probably the most preeminent cardiopulmonologist uh, in the United States, if not the world right now, uh, who actually touches patients and saves more patients' lives than we can count. Uh, I am not a heart patient. I am the son of a patient of a father who had triple bypass at 38. Uh, and I was put, put on statins before I was ever given sleep apnea. But we thought, what better way to kick off this sleep timer than to talk about the heart overlaps with sleep with Dr. Thomas uh, from Ernestine's perspective uh, as, as a family of stroke and hypertension, from Jill's perspective as a long-term chronic hypertension patient who's just now treating a sleep apnea, and to Mark Ostrick, who's a three-time survivor of open heart surgery, who is now just starting to understand there's also a sleep component as part of his quality of life. Uh, with that being said, like I said, this year we have, without fail, another hurricane, but we have a double hurricane. So, well, if we've got COVID and we've got political upheaval and we've got climate upheaval. And we have is, forest fires out west. And we have forest fires and you name it, right. we can handle it. So, Dr. Thomas... Uh, I, I appreciate you uh, opening yourselves up and, and being, uh, you know, helping us answer some of these questions uh, from a layman's uh, standpoint. Um, I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. The most important thing I think that's really important and in light of COVID that I hope we get to highlight today is how much COVID has exposed and opened up our understanding of sleep, the heart, pulmonology, uh, with all of the body as a, re as, as a result of this uh, epidemic and pandemic. Uh, and with that being said, we're really seeing it in a very high percentage of vulnerable health disparities communities. And I think that is when it comes to heart disease and diabetes and all the other co-occurring co comorbidities, comorbidities in sleep timber, that is something that we want to focus on this year for those 30 days of sleep. So that being said, uh, welcome one and all, uh, and this is in honor of Ernestine's late husband, Frederick Key, uh, and this is the first day of sleep timber. So unfortunately, we're having a little technical properties uh, problems with, with Jill's uh, Friedman, but what he was trying to get at is that he has been in and around this heart world, Dr. Thomas, for the last 20 years, dealing with his hypertension in, a, in a various ways, and he's got a family history of it. And he just in the last couple of you know months or, or as, as an exploration with, 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 the, with the ASA throughout our uh, uh, involvement with uh, the patient-focused medical product development survey that we did for the FDA that we, that we repeated in 2019, it started to come to understand the sleep component and uh, it started to feel really well uh, on his CPAP machine. And you could, we've actually been able to see it in, in his face and, and, he, and he's spoken to it from a, from a cognitive perspective, how much clearer he is during the day. So it's, 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 you know, it, sometimes it takes everyone, you know, 10, 20 years before they're, they're in denial, before they really wake up uh, and, and, and see the light with this therapy. Um, and, you know, unfortunately some of us uh, never get to that point. And uh, I think that's really one of the reasons why we wanted to have Ernestine on today to, to honor her, her late husband who, you know, had a stroke, uh, was treating the sleep apnea. And then, you know, unfortunately, went to lay down for a nap and never work, woke up because um, that mask didn't get on. Um, and the, the shame of it is, is 
the years and her experience of going through it with, with the healthcare system, uh, they never once explained to him that this is probably what led to the stroke. Um, and, and we can't fix the past and nobody's looking to do that right now. But Ernestine is the mother of a beautiful young child named Lena. And as we'll see tomorrow when we drop the video that, that, that we have been doing with my daughter and myself uh, about the, the, the potential prevention and early interventions that we can do for this disease, uh, it's our honor and our, our, our esteemed privilege to welcome not only Ernestine to our board, but also to, uh, for her to help highlight her family's story uh, so that all communities know that this is not just a rich white man's disease. So with, with that being said, Ernestine, welcome. Um, and the floor is yours uh, to sort of share with us what, what, what you have on your mind and, and to ask Dr. Thomas of, about your impressions before and after all this and to learn from him. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for uh, allowing us to honor my late husband. It's his birthday was September 1st. So I'm glad that we uh, can honor his memory um, in a way that can hopefully help other people, um, that can help other people. We're going to make it a good thing, not a bad thing. We are. We are. Um, I think I'll, I'll start to try to connect the high blood pressure dot to his stroke and to sleep apnea um, by saying we were married for 15 years. Um, he was he had hypertension before we were married, so he was taking one pill all the time daily um, for his high blood pressure. But he was also relatively healthy in the sense of he exercised a lot. He rode his bicycle a lot. He uh, was a spinner. He liked to be on a spin bike. So in terms of physical fitness, he did that really well. It was offset with poor diet um, because he did love cheeseburgers and greasy food and all of the things that um, probably contribute to not helping high blood pressure as well. But he did take a med every day um, for the 15 years that we were married. 10 years into our marriage, um, it was actually two days um, after our 10 year wedding anniversary, um, which thank God I happened to be home that day. Um, it was a, a, a school holiday. I worked for a school and, um, and he had a stroke. Um, and so at that time, he was a stay-at-home dad. Um, and his stroke, at the time, we didn't know what stroke was. Like, I didn't know signs or anything. All he said was that he wasn't feeling too well. And so we drove um, into, we drove to the emergency room and learned that he had, uh, he was having a stroke in the moment. Um and so what they asked was, was he taking any medicine? Um, and I did share that he was taking one blood pressure med, um, which I didn't know the name at the time. And I didn't have it on me at the time. Um, but they 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 treated him and he was um, in ER. Um, yeah, he was in intensive care for a while, but um, for... Yeah, he was. In so let, 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 let's stop there because that that's that's mm -hmm. that's a, that's an, an, a, a lot to deal with and, and to put out on the table. Okay. Um, Doctor Thomas, I mean, let's let's just start with the first thing: um, the stroke and the correlation to sleep apnea, and then just the knowledge for people with the early intervention. The quicker you get to that stroke, the quicker we start treating the sleep component. How much quicker the stroke patients are recovering as well mm -hmm. uh, that we know. I can't speak to the research, but because I'm the non-reliable patient narrator, but I'll leave it to the professionals. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll do a quick summary of uh, the state of the science. Yeah. So blood pressure is probably one of the most important uh, health targets. Uh, of course, there are others like nutrition. But blood pressure is such a primordial kind of force that uh, to keep it under good control is necessary for certainly long, healthy living and health of all organ systems. And when we sleep, blood pressure has very predictable changes. It drops, so-called blood pressure dipping. And whether the dipping is independently beneficial or not, one thing is clear that if we do not have this dip at night, 
uh, it results in uh, abnormal uh, long-term heart function, kidney function, brain function, and so on. So the normal blood pressure profile is a drop during sleep, which is completely disrupted when sleep is abnormal from any reason. Insomnia, restless legs, sleep apnea, and so on. But apnea itself is remarkably good at making blood pressure abnormal. And there are two fundamental mechanisms. One is that each awakening, each arousal from sleep, you have a surge in blood pressure. Besides that, the low oxygen levels, which often occurs with apnea, sensitizes the breathing control system and results in increased sympathetic activity, which raises blood pressure. In fact, uh, experiments done in the 80s showed that if you take rats and you expose them to severe drops in oxygen, uh, they will reliably uh, develop high blood pressure. But if you... Uh, uh, destroy the sensing system for oxygen in relation to sympathetic nerve activity, they do not develop it. Wow. This effect takes time, so it's not instantaneous in both directions. So when you treat, it usually takes time for a resetting. And when you develop apnea, I mean, we tend to hear the stories of those who have severe apnea, but apnea often starts in childhood. So it has a long time to develop and undergo so-called neuroplastic changes, where the circuitry actually changes, gets rewired. So while we're sleeping, if you have sleep apnea untreated, you have surges of blood pressure, like a hammer a whacking away at the system. And the brain has a lot of what's called autoregulation. It's able to buffer itself from blood pressure fluctuations, but ultimately it breaks down. Uh, in some ways, it's surprising that more people don't have strokes. That's because the autoregulation is so good. But when it breaks down, the risk of stroke is very real. And uh, unfortunately, it really happens often enough. Now, Ernestine, from, from my perspective, have you ever heard it explained in that clear of, uh, <laughs> of exchange of what's really happening? Yeah, I haven't. Um, because he was not diagnosed with apnea before the stroke, that was not even part of our vernacular. We weren't even thinking about that. Um, and then when we got to the hospital, it still wasn't discussed right away. Um, it wasn't until they were treating the, the stroke itself, um, which was pretty acute and had him in ICU for a significant amount of time. And then um, it wasn't until he kind of moved to rehab that there was the question of, or that there was the the diagnosis, I guess, of understanding what caused the stroke. Um, and then there was conversation about, oh, he might have sleep apnea because something created this irregular heart rhythm um, that then created a clot that moved up to his brain that caused the stroke. So then it was later um, discussed that, he, he might have sleep apnea and we might need to get him tested for that because that is likely what caused the stroke, what caused the irregular heart rhythm that created the clot that caused the stroke. Um, and it, it started to be true. Like once he got tested, he had um, apnea that was relatively significant. Like I don't remember what the, the score was, but it was a high score. Um, and then from there, we were using um, the CPAP regularly um but you you did you didn't he wasn't using the CPAP in the, in the, in the cardiac recovery unit right in the stroke not recovery all. not at all now so my, my question to Dr. Thomas and and, and and excuse me for if I'm right right or wrong on this because I would usually stick my foot in my mouth without fail but is it common protocol for for post acute stroke patients to be administered some sort of, of a positive airway pressure or is that, is that the, the, the exception these days for the uh, That's for the exception, but there is actually a large clinical trial which is ongoing, uh, funded by the, I believe it's the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Mm -hmm. And it's 40-odd uh, centers. It's based out of the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to use auto CPAP soon after a stroke versus right. standard care. Right. And... Uh, 
I believe the outcomes are going to be looked at six months, three months to see whether it can prevent further strokes as well as improve uh, stroke outcomes. Now, it's going to take many years for this to come through, but if it's positive, that will completely change the way we manage strokes. So after a stroke, apnea is really very common, and there's this argument whether, you know, what caused what. Uh, but clearly, when you have apnea, there is so much perturbation of physiology, it just can't be a good thing for any part of the body, never mind a brain which is just being impacted and uh, partly destroyed. So I'm optimistic, certainly hopeful, that this study will show uh, reasonable benefits, uh, and it will actually be part of uh, clinical practice. Uh, it is clearly important to um, think of sleep apnea in younger individuals with stroke, or for that matter, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, because there are very few obvious treatable conditions for high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, stroke in young individuals. And sleep apnea is already on the list in textbooks. It's unfortunate that in clinical practice, it rarely seems to be getting translated. Well, as, as we've seen from a lot of our surveys that we've accumulated over the last few years, uh, between the 80% undiagnosed that are already in all the other co-occurring comorbid <laughs> disciplines, uh, the 17 minutes of just pediatric sleep training alone that, that the physicians are getting right now, uh, I think we, uh, we've highlighted there's a cluster of many unmet needs uh, for sleep. And as we know, sleep apnea is the end of the road. We know this is an early intervention and, you know, especially for women, especially for children, if we can take care of those arousals and those interruptions, we can change the sleep architecture early on and avoid all this damage that we did to the brain, to the heart, to the, to the kidneys and, 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 the, and the liver and everything else under the sun. Um, I, I, I don't want to hog the air. I definitely had too much coffee this morning because I just want everyone to know this is also the 28th anniversary of Hurricane Andrew. August 24th. So for me and my family and friends in Miami, uh, it's one of those days that we'll ne none of us will ever forget. Uh, but with that being said, I want to pass it to my, my fellow Miami brother, uh, impatient advocate and uh, three-time uh, open heart surgery survivor uh, who's, who's uh, been helping us tell the story and helping uh, break down my ADHD and uh, helping us uh, uh, change some people's lives, hopefully, and making all this uh, all this. Uh, damage that Ernestine and her family have gone through, that, that I've gone through with my family, and that Mark has, has, has endured himself as a patient to, to help other patients out there. Because now we have, because of COVID, we have this platform to really educate people and have these conversations the right way so we can learn from the experts about what's what and what's not. So. Hi. Um, so I went into heart failure when I was one month old. Uh, my parents didn't know what was happening. Obviously, when I was showing symptoms, my lips were blue, my fingernails were blue, and I had this little cough. Um, in my medical records, I did see that I did have apnea um, early on, which was a concern for my parents because my mom would say it looked like I almost, you know, I wasn't breathing. Um, and then it was revealed that I, I had uh, this this uh, diagnosis of tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary atresia, and they didn't know if I was going to make it. Uh, through the night or through the week, um, but uh, through the, the amazing doctors at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York, um, they were able to keep me stable until I was about four. And then on uh, talking about dates, on 7777, I had my first open heart surgery. And, uh, you know. You, you, hit, you, hit, you hit the, the, the jackpot there, Mark. Yeah, uh, New York Times <laughs> said it was the luckiest day of the century. And so, so. When my mom came in after the surgery in the ICU, she almost fainted when she saw me because of all the wires and the tubes and all that stuff. But the doctor literally caught her and said, Michelle, look, look at his lips. Look, look at his fingernails. They're pink. They're not blue. And so from from that moment, uh, my family knew that I was going to be better and Luckily, I haven't really been on any medications up until very, very recently, last week, actually. Um, I was four when I had my first open heart surgery, like I said. Then I was 16 for the valve replacement, so they had to replace my, my uh, pulmonary valve. And then 27, um, at the age of 27, I had my third open heart surgery. And it's been pretty much t almost exactly 20 years um, with everything going great, um, uh, up until actually last week uh, that I haven't needed anything. 
Um, now there's some electrical signals that they just catch on like my one year, my one year uh, checkup I go every year. And uh, not that they're too nervous, but you never want to hear that tests come back a little abnormal. So I'm going to start, you know, seeing uh, uh, they put me on a low dose beta blocker. Uh, I have been since working with Adam really working on uh, better sleep hygiene and, and health, getting good amount of sleep, treating. I also have some like chronic sinus issues, but the Flonase seems to to really help uh, with that uh, to minimize inflammation in my, my sinuses. So, you know, everyone I think has a cross to bear in this life. You know, I'm lucky that, you know, they they were able to save save me and I grew up like any other normal kid with the limitation of no competitive contact sports. Um, but I feel honored to be here. And as I am on my sleep journey, I'm looking to how my sleep, better sleep health can actually help with, uh, long-term heart issues. So I, 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 I didn't mean to throw Mark under the bus and do an open intervention, Dr. Thomas, but we, we did, we did do the, 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 the classic thing where, you know, when, 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 when they say you're in denial, we said, uh, time to turn the camera on yourself and him being a, used to being a guy behind the camera. He's out of his comfort zone. Adam, uh, Adam is, uh, a- a- Adam's, uh, doing an intervention right here. This is a live, <laughs> live intervention. <laughs> a cardiovascular intervention. Cardiovascular slash uh, apnea intervention. So, you know, people like to say that I like to be a doctor and I, and I, I just say I'm one on TV. I don't, I don't pretend to be one. And I know better than to, you know, that uh, the, just the basic technology of an auto pap is not enough for him right now. And that with his history, I said, you got to talk to the only guy that I know that really should be looking at you under a titration study and, and things of that nature. Um, because if the, the great cardiologists you are talking to are not including that AFib hypertension sleep component, they don't have the whole story. Um, and that's really what sleep timber is all about is making sure that sleep, sleep apnea, all these sleep fragmentations become part of the whole primary care, universal care story. Yeah. Cause um, I, I've, I've realized if you're holding your breath while you're sleeping, you're, you're playing with your heart rhythm as well and the electrical signals of your heart. And, and, uh, you know, over this last year, I think with stress, with COVID, all these things, my, my heart checkups have gone extremely well every year in the last 20 years there uh, dr hillel lax who's a very famous surgeon did my my uh, surgery when i was 27 and every year they've been amazed with the echocardiograms and the ekgs every year i get them and they've been like saying my heart has been in perfect shape all the way up until about two months ago and and i don't know uh we're going to get to the bottom of this because it's ongoing as we speak of why the why I'm having some arrhythmia and some fast beats. Um, I don't know if it's because of sleep. It could be because of sleep. It could be because of stress. It could be because of scar tissue that is accumulated on my uh, valve that's throwing some electrical signals out, which they said is normal for 20 year survivors of, uh, you know, 20 year uh, patients that have not had a a, a valve replacement. So, you know, I'm very curious about, you know, Dr. Thomas's thoughts and how anybody with a, congenital heart defect or any kind of heart defect can um why it's important to get better sleep if if you if you're a heart patient well there are many many good reasons why you should get better sleep if you're a heart patient Uh, good sleep has a lot of cardioprotective effects Uh, there is uh so-called vagal dominance, where you have the vagal system rather than sympathetic system uh, strongly activated with good sleep. You have uh, blood pressure dipping, which is good. There are probably anti-arrhythmic effects. There are desirable metabolic effects, anti-inflammatory effects. So good sleep is generally just a good thing for the heart. It's really very interesting to note that for a wide range of cardiac disorders, Sleep apnea seems to be a very common association. That's true for atrial fibrillation. It's very true for heart failure, of course. It's probably true for congenital heart disease. Now, congenital heart disease is a very wide spectrum. What you had is uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease. You have abnormal mixing of blood from the right and left side of the heart. 
There's very little actual data, but what little data is there suggests that abnormal breathing during sleep is really very common in untreated congenital heart disease, cyanotic. But after treatment, there's scant information, but my best guess is that your breathing during sleep is not normal. And in all probability, you would have some combination of obstructive and central apnea. And central here just means your breathing rhythm is a little off kilter. And the reasons may very well be that normally there's a large amount of information going from the heart to the brain. It's silent, largely. But this visceral information, this cardiac information, if it gets scrambled in any way by, say, atrial fibrillation, cardiac surgery, and so on, it perturbs the natural rhythmic components of breathing, especially during sleep. So now you have a high risk of abnormal breathing rhythms during sleep, which shows up as apnea and so on. You know, unfortunately, measuring sleep has always been difficult and somewhat mysterious. You know, sleep lab, a lot of leads on your head, etc. But that's no longer true. Technology now really allows you to very easily measure the basics of sleep both um, medical grade and consumer grade, uh, soon, hopefully, sooner rather than later, everybody will know how well they are sleeping. Uh, and you don't have to go to a doctor to know that. Just like you stand on a bathroom scale to know your weight, there's no reason why you should not know how well you're sleeping. So, so I, 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 think. I have to ask you, do you really <laughs> think there will be a, uh, uh, an EEG component on the consumer side? to measure brain activity that will verify all this once and for all? Yeah, I hope so. The technology exists. It's more about whether developers want to, you know, perturb the system so much and make a lot of people upset. <laughs> uh, you're going to have the associations uh, screaming. Uh, I wonder why I'm making so many friends, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but, you know, you can measure hemoglobin A1C at home. Right. So why can you not measure your sleep breathing and your sleep quality at home? It seems so natural to want to, and like almost a right for people to know yes. that information. Uh, and there are many companies now who are working in that space. They just have to decide whether they want something which is FDA approved or not. Because FDA, of course, would have a higher bar of approval, but I think it's worth it. Because then it gets to the patients who really need it. So are, like, are you saying are you saying any developers that are listening to this we're encouraging them to go and make an app so that you could study your so people could have their their right to their information of how they sleep the knowledge absolutely you should go buy uh, go to CVS and buy something off the shelf uh, FDA FDA grade uh, medical grade uh, uh, hook your smartphone and generates high quality data and then you go with that data to your MD. Just like you go with your weight, with your home blood pressure, with your home blood sugar, it should be no different. Amazing. And, and then when you say over-the-counter device, you're talking about a pulse oximeter, right? It could be, <clears throat> it could be oximetry-based. It could be mm -hmm. based on other signals. But the oximeter yeah. itself, it really encodes a lot of sleep information. Not just oxygen, but also there's you know, heart rate information and so on. Similarly, many smart watches probably can do it, but they don't want to unleash it because they have to get through the FDA. Is it, is it a problem of getting through the FDA or is it literally a scientific pigment issue, which is not being talked about transparently and openly? So, some kind of combination of the two. Okay. Uh, but, you know, we have broken through so many technological barriers if there's a desire we can do it. Uh, it. It can be done. Dr. Thomas, can you speak a little bit about symptoms? Um, I think of the 15 years we were married, he was a snorer, but I never connected snoring to apnea. Um, and I know there's lots of men, um, particularly men with African heritage who aren't always um, interested in going to the doctor um, as frequently as they probably should. But if they knew that they had some symptom that could 
be um, contributing to acne or that could be a symbol, a symptom for them to like pay attention to in that way, then maybe that could help um, encourage more. And so I wonder if you could speak about acne as symptoms other than snoring or is snoring really the only real telltale sign um, just for potential patients to be aware of? So s snoring is so common that it's really not practical to chase every snorer. Now, clearly, if you have high-quality home testing for sleep quality and apnea, and then it becomes a bit of a mood point. But given what we have today, if you're snoring, it's something else. Uh, poor sleep quality, fatigue in the daytime, or you witness apneas, that is, you notice that it's not just snoring, but they're actually stoppages. Uh, that is certainly reasonable uh, to, you know, to follow through. Uh, unfortunately, about a third of patients with substantial apnea have no daytime symptoms. It's quite a mystery, in fact. It's a bit like uh, you cut, but you do not bleed. Uh, even in the sleep clinic, we find occasional patients with just a lot of apnea, but just minimal to no symptoms. It's quite a mystery, but it's real. So for such a person, unless you have some objective testing, you may just not pick it up. But otherwise, if you wake up unrefreshed constantly, tired in the daytime, need to take naps, someone notices that you're, you know, stopping to breathe. If you're clearly obese, uh, those are uh, likely, you know, reasons to pursue. It is still a schlep to get it. You know, you still have to go to the dog, get the test. I mean, it is not made easy at all, unfortunately. We are, we are kind of guilty of that, the sleep field, of not making it easy enough to ask a fairly simple question, do I have apnea or not? And if there is, is it something which I need to pursue or not? You, you've been living in Boston long enough to, to be schlepping. Uh, we, we want to remove the, uh, the obstacles and barriers to getting testing because the testing is one thing. I mean, we could also teach people about inspecting the airway uh, just with a basic visual inspection and know whether people are really snoring or just like I did with Mark said, have, have your wife put your camera on yourself. So I think the diagnosis is is one thing. I think the the, the hybrid consumer medical grade testing is another barrier, obstacle, or inflection point. But the third is really that ability to go straight to some sort of treatment, no matter what door you're walking through. So even Marcus said, you know, he started doing some of the you know taping his lips closed, so he breathes with his nose, and trying some of those behavioral things or positional sleep apnea. Um, I have been using the nasal strips, right. And uh, that's helped, and the Flonase has helped, and my wife has noticed that I've stopped snoring basically over the last three or four weeks. Um, and eat certain diet stuff a, 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 before I go to sleep, you know, I used to have like, uh, you know, some type of dessert or something at night before I go to sleep. Just that, even that has helped uh, the snoring, um, and. My wife's even recorded me because I don't even believe her that I'm, that I would snore that loud, and she would show me the video of me <laughs> snoring extremely loud, and it's it's hard to believe. You know, there's I think there's a lot of denial with with uh, sleep issues, and I I don't know, Doctor Thomas, if you if you see that or Ernestine, if if you if you had those issues um, where you'd say you know you're snoring a lot, and it's just like I can't be that bad. I don't I'm not hearing it. I don't see it, and so therefore it's not it can't really be happening. Absolutely. All too common. All too common. That's that's really the, the the genesis of this conversation is 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 Ernestine is the victim of of a, of a husband she lost to a stroke of you know eventually, and I don't want anyone to ever have to get to that point. There's no reason. Sleep apnea is the end of the road. AFib really is the end of the road. These are all things that are happening. We think as a result, you know, one day we'll be able to prove it all and connect the dots with the science, uh, and make sure that the literature supports it all. But right now. I can speak as an N of one, as one person and say that I know that, you know, I was taking high, I was taking statins for, for, for uh, high cholesterol because I had hyperlipidemia because I had a father with triple bypass at 38 and early onset at 50. Uh, I wound up in rhabdomyosis as a, with a word of reaction because my blood oxygen was low. We didn't know to look at the sleep. Um, I, it's those obstacles and, and, and barriers out there that, that 
I want to use this platform to get out there. I'm not worried about whose toes we stepped on, but the more people that can learn that there's, there's, you know, that the system can, can help us. But, you know, COVID's really exposed the system. There's no reason to throw it all out, but let's go fix it all now. Now that we know that, you know, everything's on the table. Yeah. And from a patient perspective, it's, it's, you know, we're, we are sitting on real world evidence. We know what our patients are really dealing with. They're not just in silos. They're not just claims data. It's, it's all of it, you know? I mean, right now, the, there are, you know, pretty good oximeters available on Amazon. The ones which give you a whole night trace are, you know, like $150, that range. Uh, those are pretty good in telling you that, you know, if you're clearly abnormal. Of course, they have disclaimers that, you know, this is not a medical device and those kinds of things. Uh, but the problem is that it's... Well, on a large scale, that's pretty expensive for something that you just need once or twice. Right. Uh, there should be a simpler way to be able to just measure it and maybe return it. I mean, a different kind of model where, you know, you don't need to uh, feel that you are, you know, losing money, you know, one night and then you toss it. That seems a bit much for something like an oximeter. Yeah. I'd love to see the, the insurers one day get on board with us and the patients, you know, and CMS and say, look, if, if you treat the sleep and, and, and the patients are not taking advantage of the system, all the other things get mitigated, the diabetes, the, high, the hypertension. And it's, it's really in our interest to make, make sure that the sleep is treated in a preventative sort of f- format. You know, when I've gone up to D.C. or up to the hill, this, you know, and with, with some of these other professional societies or organizations, it's it's the, everybody's looking for the the cure side of it, the, the 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 business side of it. And I'm saying we have something right under our nose that's been sitting here all along. Mark since he was 1977, me since I was a two year old. Uh, you know, Ernestine with, with an eight year old child now, who's you know who's, who's going to be 30 years ahead of where where it started for her husband Frederick. I mean, she's you know he was a bass player. She she just she just found the missing note of the whole line. And it's 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 gonna it's gonna change her family's life, and it's gonna all the people that'll come out from there. Uh, I just don't want us to be the exceptions anymore. I want it to become the rule. Um, so I, I I can't thank you enough for sharing your knowledge with us uh, and putting some of this into English because all these organs, all these all these systems, and how they interact, chicken or egg, uh, is just it's it's. For anyone who's a, a rocket scientist to figure out, let alone someone who's cognitively impaired and sleep deprived our whole life, to try to make sense of it and connect the dots about what needs to be done and what the priority is so that we don't wind up on your table um, and that we can prevent this. Because we don't want to put you out of business, doctor. We want you to save the, the hard cases. <laughs> oh, we have no no fear of being out of business. I know. <laughs> uh, the, uh, see, one, one of the challenges is that uh, – if leave aside sleep as a whole, but just sleep apnea alone. Mm -hmm. Good treatment of apnea is is fairly effortful, both for the patient and for the physician. Uh, There just aren't enough physicians with specific training available. We just need a very different model somehow, uh, where the physician is not the bottleneck, but really sets the tone, is the guidance Uh system. And uh, we use data data management to uh, track those who are doing well, those who are not doing well. We have a wider range of treatment options. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, having treatment which gets to maybe 10 to 15% of the potential population, maybe 20%, even 30%, it's just not enough. I mean, the majority of patients with apnea are still not being diagnosed or treated. And any way you slice and dice our current models is not going to work. No. It needs an entirely new thinking, uh, probably by s- someone like, you know, Google or... <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we know, as, as you know, as a patient organization, we, we, we've done a lot of work with the, with the, the academics and, and, the, and the regulatories and NIH and patient-centered outcome research and with, with the, the for-profits and the apples and and, uh, and 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 those sorts, and and I think if there's going to be a combination. And so it's, there's a, there was a great open source uh, initiative done amongst the sleep apnea patients with Sleepy Head software a few years ago, where they were you know basically a guy was trying to reverse engineer the manuals just to be able to make sense of the memory cards and what data we're getting, 
And, you know, but we never collected and pulled all that data together to see, to compare apples to apples. Um, so th there's an opportunity here now with the digital divide, with the, 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 the virtual world we're living in, with, with this crisis and COVID, uh, to sort of bring all these pieces and there's enough for the, everyone to rise. You know, for me, it comes back to sleep being a third of our lives. Yeah. The do not ask, do not tell mentality came not from the LGBTQ world and the military. It came from if you, if a, if a, if a primary care physician asked a patient about their sleep, it added 10 minutes to that encounter. That doubled the encounter. It, sh it shortened, it, it cut in half how many patients they could see in a day. There's a lot of reasons for that. But that mindset alone is another bottleneck. But isn't so sleep I, now considered a, like the third pillar of health? It's it's eat, diet, exercise, and sleep. I mean, is that widely accepted as the three pillars of health? By word, yes, but not by actions. Right. So as an example, if you're a diabetic and you go to the physician, they have a checklist they have to do. They just have to check your renal functions, your get your get make sure you get your yearly eye exams, et cetera, et cetera. Sleep is not part of a mandatory assessment of anything. Hmm. Anything. There is no vital sign for sleep. Yeah. There's no, well, put it very crudely, there is no punishment for not evaluating sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good way to but put it. But there is punishment for not measuring someone's creatinine. Right. Hmm. And given high blood pressure, and I think diabetes was also mentioned for a moment, um, but given those two particular uh, conditions are really high in the black community, when they, go to, when, when they go to the doctor and are diagnosed with these, is this a regular question or can it be posed by the patient as a regular, become a regular question that gets posed by patients that will be um, received okay by the medical community or will it be dismissed as, oh no, we only check that if? Uh, some other oh, no, uh, you, you won't be dismissed. You won't be dismissed. It's just uh, catching attention. The primary care physician has to deal with so many things. The EHR is yelling at them, you know, make sure you do X, Y, Z, you know. So sleep What's gets the lost. EHR? The What's EHR? Uh, electronic health records. Okay. It, it is, as they say, and I can say this, Dr. Thomas, an epic failure. <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. Yes. No pun intended, yes. But, yeah, I mean, so that has to change. I, I feel like the more conversations like this get out, the more that we as patients can kind of talk about this in an open forum that hopefully inspires other people, realize how important that, that sleep function is to to their overall health and, and not to take it for granted and, and to not be afraid to ask their primary care physician and, 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 and to be able to stand up and, and, and ask for those answers and, and not be so kind of uh, meek and timid in front of their primary care physicians. I think people should feel empowered to, to want to get answers to these questions. And uh, African-Americans and uh, Hispanics, they simply have more apnea as a community, as a group. There's lots of data showing this. So, uh, and Asians, we don't even have to be obese to have substantial apnea. So there are some groups uh, where apnea is more severe. It has uh, more, uh, you know, impact on the body. Uh, it just needs to be part of standard medical practice. And, uh, you know, standard medical practice has to do so many things uh, that I just fear that uh, without easy personalized diagnostics, uh, we'll be having this conversation forever. I mean, that's the way to do it. You just have to have an easier way to self-diagnose or self-assess critical physiologies. And that is true for blood pressure. That's true for blood sugar, um, sleep, you name it. And then to work as a multidisciplinary complement and guide right. to get you the right intervention at the right time right. for that moving target and journey that you're going to have or for your child your whole life. Because yep. it changes over time what the right – protocol is and what it needs to be. I think it's so true what you're saying, Dr. Thomas, about being able to self-diagnose with, with over-the-shelf or over-the-counter products, because if you're able to go into a doctor's office and say, here's the data, they, they can't really deny that. that that's, right. It's not like anecdotal at that point. It's not just like, oh, I'm snoring, or my wife says I'm holding my breath. And, and But if you could go in and 
show them and there is some personal responsibility care that you can take on your own, I think it would, you know, like you said, if, if that doesn't happen, this conversation is going to go on for many more decades. Plus, these devices allow you to track. So let's say you're targeting weight loss, body positioning, treatment of allergies, you know, simple upper airway surgery, you know, you can track. Uh, you may decide uh, now, right now, you're not ready for apnea treatments. Fine. Track yourself five years down the road. Maybe it's got more severe. The whole thing is very dynamic. It's not static. Yeah. So being able to track is just important. Yeah. And, to rely, and to rely on that data that we're tracking, because yeah. that's we at the ASA and at sleepapnea.org, you know, we want to make sure that we point north in that. And since we're not just a representative of the device companies, much to many people's chagrin, <laughs> which people yeah. think uh, we're anything but that, uh, we're not married. We're married to everyone because our patients, we're dealing with a syndrome. They come in all different doors and shapes and at different points of their life where sleep apnea starts to affect them. Uh, and in Ernestine's case, it, it comes back to, it's that education. It's in the community. The more the trusted messengers are that people know, and those patients go in back to their, their healthcare provider or their, their clinic or their community, and they know these are the questions. What about my sleep? No, I'm not just taking the meds. I want to know I, there's something that I can do that's non-invasive that's not going to, you know, or I'm not going to put my kid on this 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 Adderall or a stimulant before there's been a sleep workup. I mean, things as yeah. simple as that. Um you know, just yeah, unfortunately, uh, when you use the word sleep workup, the first thing which flashes into anybody's mind is, oh, oh, this is a full lab sleep study, long waiting time. I mean, we we have uh, unfortunately a well deserved reputation, which is not uh, very open in that sense. Uh, a lot of barriers, a lot of you know, from the pursuit of excellent data, we are uh, killing. Uh, the ease of data collection. Now, clearly, you don't want bad data, but you want the right data for the right question. But we've made it so hard to even get that data. That's true. And that, that, that to me, is, is the real shame of this because there's so much we could be learning from it if, if we had access to the so-called data so that, that we're not guessing that not, you know, with just, you're not the exception, that we know that when you're titrating, we're, everyone's learning from what the kind of work you're doing. And it's not just being hoarded and, and proprietary inside the industry. Right. And, and that, that's why I'm scared to say to Mark, well, you go use this XYZ auto path that'll take care of you. I can't, I know better than to say that. But I on know the positive side, I mean, look at what technology we're able to do here. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You're in Florida. I'm in Laguna Beach. Uh, Dr. Thomas, you're in Boston, right? Ernestine, mm -hmm. you're in the South. You're in Louisiana. Texas. 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 You're in <laughs> Texas. I mean, that's, it's incredible that we could all be having this conversation simultaneously live from four different states um, with hurricanes and wildfires, all these <laughs> things happening around us. And we're still able to have this uh, knowledge transfer, you know. And so to me, you know, we, we always try. I, I think it's important to look on the bright side and, and hopefully people from seeing this can can do some some reflection and and try to get the care they need either for their cell themselves or for, for a loved one, you know, and uh, someone in their family, a friend um, that that's what this is all about. And, and sleepapnea.org and the American association is, of uh, sleep apnea, is, I, I think is really, you're doing a great job Adam, with getting the word out and trying, you know, bringing people together here um, with Ernestine sharing stories and Dr. Thomas giving, shedding some light on some of these issues. I'm just, I, I, I'm just amazed that this is even happening and we could be having these conversations. Well, I, I want to come back to what Dr. Thomas said earlier. You know, some of the reason that the, the, the clinical care hasn't been penalized, they're penalized if they don't measure your heart, blood pressure, your primary care doctor, or if, they, if, they're, if they're looking at your A1C. What's so ironic about this disease and, and CPAP intervention in particular is for the Medicare patients, if you don't use your machine enough uh over four hours for 70 or for 70 percent of the time for the first 30 of your 90 days of getting the equipment they come and take the machine away where it's the antithesis is if you don't use your diabetes medicine or if you're not taking your hypertension they come and provide you the education so we've made the barriers just to even getting the prescription the, the therapy let alone 
we made it even harder to even continue using it. Ernestine, did you realize that they would take away a CPAP machine in 90 days if he... <laughs> I, I did not know that. When you just said that, I was a, a little surprised. It did. It was a little cumbersome to even have it. I will say that because having to go through this little training that seemed a little odd. And then when we get home with it, trying to understand the cleaning part of it was a little tricky for us as well. And then it was also just cumbersome to use, like just putting it on all the time. It wasn't like a I mean, it just it's not intuitive at all. At all. I think at all. CPAP may be the only treatment where if you are struggling with it, if you're not able to get the best benefit, it is taken away. There's probably no other treatment where you get punished for not succeeding with your treatment. Yeah, I feel like somebody should go to like the Capitol Hill, go to the Hill and talk about that. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 mind blowing that your your therapy would be taken away just because you're struggling or not using it properly. To me, to me, when I when I found that out, it, it was like being hit in the head with a sledgehammer. You know, it, it, it was it was done in response, unfortunately, to the business side of the the, the field in the industry. It, it, it was taken advantage of the testing and the reimbursements and and CMS, which sets the the bar and tone for Medicare, and then the insurance companies followed. They 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 cracked back and said, "You guys are taking advantage of us." And, they, and the doctors, you know, instead of making a good ethical case about why this should be what it is, it wasn't done because the business was the first priority and not the patient's outcomes. Unfortunately, am I am I right in saying that, Doctor Thomas? You Pretty much. Yours? I mean, whenever Medicare did audits, they found stuff like dead people getting mass and I mean, just yeah. all kinds of things. And each time they would come down with a rule, which kind of made sense at a certain level, but then over time, you know, just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the, the idea of uh, if you're not using your treatment well, you don't deserve it. That makes no sense. I mean, if a diabetic is struggling, let's say a type 1 diabetic is struggling getting the sugar under control, properly using a complex insulin regimen, the last thing you would think is that you take away the insulin, right? So there is no slack for comorbid diseases, comorbid social stressors, comorbid intellect, you name it. So it's the same rule whether you are a vibrant 65-year-old, whether you are a person with Alzheimer's, age 75, barely know who you are, it is four hours, 70% of the time, in a certain time frame. After that, they don't care. For a chronic disease, that is completely nonsense. Amazing. Wow. Ernestine, you're on mute. You want to follow up as, as far as your, your last thoughts or just everything you heard in our first day and what, what the power of this platform that we have to be able to bring on great leaders and, 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 and minds and people who will sit down at the table with us uh, as yeah. doctors like Dr. Thomas and, and help yeah. us spread Absolutely. the knowledge. Absolutely. Just another thank you for um, another time, another way to kind of just keep promoting and educating people to – to think for them to kind of be more self advocates. Um, I think because we just aren't thinking about it, sometimes we don't even know what we don't know. Um, so to put it on our minds and then to give us a, a motivation to want to do something more to prevent um, our health from going from bad to worse, because it's, it won't take much for it to happen in that way, um, especially, particularly. Um, people in the black community and it's particularly men who don't always um, go get treated the way they could. It's going to be the women. It's going to be the women that, that, that save the day. I think yeah. here. You know, Asian men usual. are no different. Asian men are probably worse. Like my yeah. father, I can imagine him ever accepting something like CPAP regardless. Right. I mean, right. Men don't ask. Uh, men no. don't stop at the at, at the at the gas station and ask for directions, right? Right. <laughs> it's going to well, take I, the women I, to save the world. I know. You, I know. There's a health disparities question. I mean, discussion coming up. But isn't it true, Ernestine, from the African American community that you know a lot of people were raised like if it's not hanging off, don't don't go to the doctor because you don't know what's going to happen. That you know historically, Tuskegee, what happened there, and. You know, there's a lot of mistrust, in, in, you know, from the African American community with with doctors. Is is that is that true? And is that something that you've found 
from your own personal experience? I think there's a combination of the trust that that or mistrust that exists, but there's also just the financial barriers that sometimes exist. Um, for healthcare, um, and so sometimes it's a uh, can I live through this and not have to worry about it because that's a cost to go to the doctor to find out that there's nothing really wrong um, versus this is money that I could use for something else. So sometimes it's a, a financial um, question, um, and sometimes it's a trust question um, that will they will they abuse us? Will they misuse us? Will they, um, will they even diagnose us right? Will there be assumptions made about our health as a result because of who we are? Um, so all of those things kind of play um, into reasons that we choose or ch choose to or not to go to the doctor. And then once we're there, advocate for ourselves beyond what the doctor says, because doctors don't always bring sleep apnea to the table. We have to bring it to the table ourselves. I think it's part of the message um, today that it, they won't just automatically offer that as something to consider. So. And, and I think, Ernestine, that is a great way for us to wrap up this conversation. I want to be cognizant of, of your time and Dr. Thomas' time. Everybody's volunteering their time to help help our community. Uh, and with that being said, we are going to be exploring those health disparities through all the different vulnerable populations and all the comorbid populations all month of sleep Uh I know we're going to have Dr. Giardine John Louis from NYU talking about uh, diabetes. I know we have Dr. Shelley Barrison going to be talking about uh, allergies and, and reflux and, and asthma and, 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 and those populations. Um, and, 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 and I believe we have a few other talks uh, with some current COVID updates uh, with Dr. potentially Dr. Partha Sarathi and Dr. Uh, Zizi Satius uh, at the end of the month to sort of wrap us up. Uh, hopefully we all make it through uh, this next wave of the COVID pandemic and we're safe and that everyone wears their mask. Uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I don't need to tell it to this crowd, but for those that are uh, worried about themselves, their family, or their loved ones, um, putting that mask on not only will help you, but it'll, it'll help save someone else's life right now. Uh, and we've got a long way to go. And 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 if we keep our sleep up and we get, keep, that'll help keep us, give a strong immune system. Uh, sleep timber, which was normally our back to school time. Uh, we're not, we're going back to the future. It's a new world. It's a new education format, new probably political environment, uh, new healthcare environment, that this is time for everyone to get their sleep and because we're going to need it to be able to, to, to have the stamina and the fatigue and the, and the endurance to make it through this, this, this next year or so. Well said. And Ernestine, thank you so much for having the courage to come and share your story with us. Mm -hmm. Thank Not you so much. Easy. Yeah, thank you for having me. And again, September 1st would have been my husband's uh, birthday. He was uh, relatively young. He was in his 50s when he passed. And so um, we hope that others will learn from uh, the message that we're given today and live longer, healthier lives. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Ernestine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. This, Thomas, too. This, this sleep timber is for Fred. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.